Well, welcome all you wiretappers out there. I'm back here in the studio, Gangland Wire. I have a, a really cool show for you, I think. A couple of friends of mine, a couple of former KCPD guys, Jim Harrington and Rick Smith. Uh, Jim Harrington was a robbery detective, and Rick Smith was a robbery detective at one time. Now they went on to have other things. Rick went on to be the chief of police, and and Rick, you went. Were you a detective the whole time? In, in robbery, just in robbery. Okay. So and I anyway. remained a detective my whole career. <laughs> so uh, one of you guys is ambitious and one of them ain't so ambitious when it comes to management level stuff. Although I understand, Jim, you I know, mean, Sergeant was the high, highest rank I ever wanted to be. And, and I never wanted to go any higher. There's too much responsibility. Everybody's shooting for you all the time. It was bad enough being a sergeant sometimes if you had to, the right job, as I found out to my sure again there at the end. I ended up back on dog watch at Metro when I had about 23 years on. But anyhow, <laughs> now, I, I'm not bitter, <laughs> but these guys worked a really, really cool, famous case. And it really, it was on a mob guy named Angelo Perello, who was pretty close to Nick Savella at one time. I don't know if he was a made guy or not. He's never really showed up on the made guy list from the old days, but he was a real active member of the Savella crime family. And he had a pawn shop out here and he was taking what we call swag. He was taking things that fell off a truck. Well, but in this case that these guys were, he was taking $2 million or two and a half million dollars in diamonds and other jewelry from one of the highest end jewelry stores we have in Kansas city. So, so Jim or Rick, you know, whoever wants to start, tell us how you got into this case. All right. So, we, we, you know, robbery worked two shift, a day shift and an evening shift. This happened at 10 o'clock in the morning and we weren't working. It was the other, the B team was at work. And so they went, to, they responded to the scene, um, but it was a big enough case that it, it started to overlap the shift. Um, and I think our involvement happened when uh, a Metro dog watch officer pulled over a car. And I think there might've been a short car chase. They stopped a car at 63rd and Ward Parkway. Um, they had guns in the car. These guys were all from out of town. As it turns out, they were robbers from Los Angeles. And that case was big enough, you know, that the Tibble case was big enough that there was some thought that these could have been an out of town crew that had come in. Um, Rick was convinced of it. Um, and it made a lot of sense based upon the guys' records involved. So we had them in. We served a couple search warrants at some hotels on the plaza, which made it, you know, even more suspicious. They were and closer to Tibble. What did but you it find? turns out the the head guy or the I don't remember what the ringleader's name of that group was, but he's like, I can't I'm not gonna deny that I haven't done crime, but I didn't do that one. I so you know you told him it was about a robbery of a jewelry store on the plaza and it was almost like, oh well, <laughs> I don't know what all I've done because I'm not from this city, but I know I didn't rob a high end jewelry store. Um and we ended up working a couple days trying to establish whether it was them or not. And as it turns out they were committing a credit card fraud at the time within 45 minutes of the robbery. And it didn't seem likely that they'd just done a two and a half million dollar jewelry store robbery. And they were trying to score a $2,500 laptop computer 45 minutes later up the street. Um, so ultimately it, that initial part didn't lead anywhere, but Rick was adamant that, you know, this is a one time in a career case and we should try to work it. So we ended up working it and working it and working it and eventually it got assigned to us it was the original detective didn't continue working it we were lucky enough to be making connections with people outside that it made it easier just to give to assign it to us can i add to that jim as long as you're so, not going to talk bad about anybody <laughs> i'm not going to talk bad but i am going to say that jim and i were sitting in the squad room and we were talking and i said we should work this case. We, we uh, Jim and I were having the discussion. We're like, we should work this case. And Jim goes, it's not our case. And I go, it should be our case because we're the only ones putting any effort into it. I think one of the main things that came from the other detectives working the case is they set up off duty at the, at the Tibbles, which needed to be done. But to Jim and I was not much investigative work. It was, a necessary tangent of this case and off duty, I think it's still at Tibbles today, but uh, we wanted to do the investigative part. And Jim and I decided at that time that we would, instead of 
just go behind the scenes. We go straight to that sergeant and say, we want to take this case. And that's what we did. So apparently Do you remember that, Jim? <laughs> no, I don't remember saying that to that sergeant, but we had a really good supervisor. <laughs> we did. We had a really good sergeant, but I can remember walking into his office at the time and saying to him, Sergeant, we would like to have this case, and here's the reasons why. And he was not too happy about the whole conversation. <laughs> but in the end said, all right, I see you guys have a point. And he said, let's see what you can do. And we were allowed to then go out and, and start working the case, not behind everyone's back, but out in front. And that's, that's how it got started. And our sergeant supported us 100%. And the solvability of that case was pretty low. Yeah. I mean, you know, there weren't a lot of leads, you know, so there wasn't going to be any forensic evidence to tie him to it at the scene because of the way they were dressed. Um, and the forensics weren't quite what they are today. Um, so we started, I had somebody that was telling me, I wouldn't call him an informant because he wasn't, he wasn't paid by, the, I had somebody that I had arrested before that was telling me and, uh, Rick had somebody, I don't remember the one guy who faded, but we had a couple different people saying that Clarence Burnett was behind it. So uh, before, we, before we go any farther, set the scene. How did this robbery go down? So they arrived in a, I want to say it was a Jeep Cherokee. They pulled up in front, just stopped um, blocking the, you know, the, the first lane of traffic. And they went in the store. Um, they split up. So somebody, somebody went to the safe. So they, you know, somebody had the assignment of getting in the safe. And then somebody had a sledgehammer in there trying to break into the cases. Well, Tivils has really, really, really nice cases, and you can't get into them with a sledgehammer. Oh. So they beat on those. I think they struck one of the cases 21 times or something like that. And it just it broke, but it never, it was like a windshield safety glass. It wouldn't get out of the way. They ended up getting somebody with a key to open up. They, I think they only broke one case. They ended up getting a key to open up the backs of the others. Um, and at the time, so there'd been a, there'd been a series of robberies. I should probably back up because uh, Marodi's got robbed in February of 97, which is, you know, that's a pretty high end jewelry store up north yeah. of the river. Um, that was Rick's case. And he had that case from the get go. He'd been working that and that trailed off into a different series of crooks who didn't do the, the robbery, but they had been doing a bunch of other stuff. But that the Marodi's robbery really wasn't going anywhere. Um, and they had done a they had. So this crew, when we found out later, they had robbed a McDonald's. They had robbed a CVS. Um, they'd robbed a couple other places, and I think the idea was that they were practicing some timing. Mean, I never got that. They were, you know, robbing a CVS is a pretty low skill. Same yeah. with the McDonald's. I, I don't know if it was practice, but there was definitely a acceleration going from like fast food to CVS to jewelry stores, as I remember. They had walkie-talkies and communication and you know, mask, glove, gun. I mean, they were definitely practicing their trade and getting much better and looking for bigger scores. And now, whether that was just practice or just how they evolved, I don't know. But I remember Jim and I going back and looking at the, the earliest cases and where they were to where they had gone to. And there was definitely a progression in their amount of professionalism, so to speak, in their robberies. Would you agree to that, Jim? Yeah. And I think the first, actually, I give, I say Marodi's was the first. I think it was a a place at 75th and Warnold that was a in pawn a, shop, wasn't it? It wasn't a pawn shop. I think it was a secondhand jewelry store. But they sold, so they advertised that they sold Rolex watches. So Marodi's sold Rolex watches, and obviously Tibble uh, sold Rolex watches. Um, so there was sort of a common theme. And it's not like we put all these things together as it was going on because we didn't know about the string until afterward. But when you look back and they nearly got caught at 75th and Warnell by the best policeman I think we've ever had on the department. Well, one of the best. Gary, I think he took your position in intelligence. He lived, he was a St. Peter's guy. So what happens on Christmas or 
Terry, Terry Finn. Finn. There you yeah, go. Yeah. So oh, Terry heard the call come out at oh, that's right at the, at the jewelry store, and he drove to where he thought he was. He wasn't working. He was. It was like a Saturday. Yeah. That's but Terry, Terry started thinking because he lives out there. He started yeah. thinking, where are they going to drop that car? And he drove to what turns out to be the uh, Sutherland's. Now it wasn't then. It was still the AMF Bowling mm -hmm. Supply place. Yeah. He and he was within like seconds of because that's where they dumped the car. And Terry almost caught them there. Mm -hmm. Now, was uh, that part of their MO, have a car to do the robbery and like bank robbers do, and then yeah. drop that car and have their other car waiting for them somewhere else and take off and switch cars? Well, they, they did that. And in the, so in the Tivil robbery, they left and Clarence was driving his personal truck um, that had a tonneau cover on the, so it was a pickup truck with a tonneau cover on it. And they drove that stolen Cherokee up to Loose Park, dumped it, and then they got in the truck, but they all laid down in the back. Mm -hmm. So it's a single guy driving a Dodge pickup truck. It's not three guys in a in a Jeep. And then he just drove back over to his house. Yeah. Now um, you you mentioned the name Clarence. Now Clarence is Clarence Burnett, or guy call, they call Papa, who was the ringleader of this crew and also a drug kingpin, a cocaine kingpin at the city at the time. Is that yeah? Uh, so. I I've heard him called Paw Paw, not Paw Paw, but I think it depends on who's talking. Okay. But yes, Clarence was the the driver. He drove. He set it up, and he drove his personal truck to pick up the guys when they dumped the car. So now you've you've got the robberies happen. It went down like this. They're, they've gotten away. They you're starting as you start your investigation. You start pulling similar. Try to find similar crimes to see if there's a pattern here. And, right. and so then you start running down different tips and you you've got informants that are talking about different people. So how did it work from there? What was your kind of your next avenue? You say you had somebody that mentioned this Clarence Burnett. We did, but that was so the FBI was pursuing some leads and we were pursuing leads separately. It was not a cohesive investigation at the time, um, but we got invited along because they had information that they had a bondsman in Kansas city was buying. He had some of the stolen jewelry from the Tibble store. Um, I, here's a funny thing about the Rolex watches though. So they didn't take any brand new watches from Tibble. The only Rolex watch they got was out of the safe. It was in for repair and it was a Kansas city uh, criminal defense attorneys whose watch was in the, <laughs> that's the only Rolex that they got. I think it became, probably apparent to them and uh, it become apparent to me and Ricky over that year that that wasn't a really good thing to steal. Those, those are, uh, they have a serial number on them and, and you could go back and get records from 1973 to now on who that watch. So where that watch had moved, if it had ever been in for repair, it was logged. It was a pretty uh, intricate system. And I think it must have become apparent to them that that was a bad thing to steal because it was easy to, I think it would be easy to get caught selling one. But so we, we have, so the FBI's got somebody assigned to it and we're, you know, we're talking to them, but we're really working two different ways. So we get invited on a surveillance because they're going to buy some of this purported stolen jewelry from Tibbles and we help with the surveillance. And it's a bondsman downtown on, was it on 10th street? Mm -hmm. Casey Bondi was on 10th street. So we're helping with the surveillance, but we're sort of extra. We're sort of moving around and somebody there's lots of cars pulling up in front of the bail bond company. And one of them leads. And then right after that, they say the bondsman's ready to deliver the jewelry to us. So if anybody saw a car and we said, well, yeah, we can still see the car. So we go catch up to the car and we pass by it. And I recognize Clarence Burnett from previous um, encounters with him when I was in a uniformed officer and attack, attack unit. Um, so we're like, holy shit, that must be the guy who's, you know, so we, we had already had the name yeah. and then here he's, here he is in the car cool. <laughs> that just left the bondsman when supposedly the bondsman's gotten a delivery of some of the Tibble jewelry. So they took that jewelry to. When they bought that jewelry, they checked that in house. And then remember, then we set up, I think we, we leveraged somebody 
and we set up this thing at the embassy suites on the plaza, whereas the FBI came in with the team, and that, that's when we bought some loose diamonds, and they ran them down the freight elevator, and I was waiting at the base of the freight elevator. I took those loose diamonds, went to a jewelry store, Brian Swork, and in, 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 he had a store in the plaza at the time, and ran up there, and he looked at them underneath the microscope and found one that had a serial number, I guess, the certain brand of diamond had serial numbers embedded in the diamonds. And it was one of the stolen diamonds from Tibble. And that's how we made the connection. So that's <laughs> otherwise they were going to have to. So each diamond, especially expensive diamonds are mapped. If I, yeah. Probably yeah. not the right term, but they know, uh, you know, so somebody's drawn a map of what the diamond, the shape is and the clarity and all the other stuff that, you know, they tell you when you're buying your wife's wedding ring. Um, but that's a little harder. Some of the or some of the jewels at Tibble had a serial number etched on the crown, the side of the crown, and you could see it. So they said, "Well, yeah, this seems to be a pretty easy call. There's the serial number, and there's the list of not every diamond had it, but yeah. some of there's a specific brand of diamond that does that." Um, if you've got one that you can identify that came out of the Tibble for sure by that number, all the others with it, you just pretty yeah. much assume that's part yeah. of that swag. So let's go back to that first sting at the bail bondsman downtown and you identify Clarence Burnett. Yep. So then what's your next step right after identifying Clarence Burnett? Well, then we, we have a, you know, meeting after the, that operation was over and we said, Hey, you know, our, we have sources saying that it's Clarence Burnett is the person who did the robbery. And, you know, you guys called out that car, Ricky and I followed it. And I can tell you that was Clarence Burnett in that car. So that sort of started the, you know, that's a big break, you know, at least, yeah, you know, yeah. you know where you're going. And so then we started working it from that angle, but the FBI continued. So I was, I forgot about the embassy suites, but they did the second takedown. And then they, uh, the bondsman flew to Dallas and this, this FBI agent was, I mean, that was his undercover role was a jeweler. Um, and they, I don't know what else they bought from him. So they had, the Bureau had an undercover who's, who was saying he was a jeweler, kind of like John, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Pistone, Donnie Brasco. He, yeah. His cover was that he knew a lot about jewelry. So they had somebody. Is that who set up the original uh, uh, bondsman in Kansas City, that guy there, that agent? So he he he's just a guy, he's just an actor that they, that the local office brings in because yeah. okay. he is a jeweler. I mean, I think he's yeah. legitimately knows everything you, he could go sell jewels is what I'm saying. So they brought him in specifically participate in that part of the operation. And again, we weren't, so we weren't really, we got invited to help with the surveillance. So all the pre planning that was going on, we're, we weren't really a part of, we didn't get okay. invited to that part. So they had they had somebody next to this bondsman downtown, and then they bring in this jeweler to yeah. identify help identify those diamonds and and that kind of thing. But they don't really take him down at the time. They no, there was some time, and are they are they the ones oh. that bought the diamonds in that day after Clarence left? He delivered them. The yes. bondsman had it, and then the bureau bought them from Clarence. No, we bought them from the bondsman. I mean, from from the bondsman. I'm sorry. I'm so I meant. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I'm with you now. So, so then they they start pursuing. They start pursuing the bondsman. Right. Um. But as it turns out, he's only got so when, I think they eventually bring him in, and he says, "So he's he's done. He's on videotape. He's he's done." And but he says, "I didn't set this up, and I didn't buy that many pieces of." I know Clarence from bailing him out type thing, but yeah. I didn't buy that much jewelry from Clarence. It certainly wasn't what was reported to have been taken in the, in the robbery. Um, and I think that was an important part too, Jim, the, the relationship between Clarence and got us in is that guy had bonded Clarence out for his other criminal stuff on other charges. And I think that's how he made that connection into them. And that's how the, 
that's how the connection was made from the people who were taken in the proceeds from the robbery to how do we get the people who are actually going to do the robberies. That connection was through that bonding company, that initial, I think, like introduction. Would you agree, Jim? Yeah. Yeah. So then the bureau, we knew bureau, it was going to it was going to it was going to take a big fence for two and a half million dollars yeah, worth of jewelry. Yeah. Yeah. So the bureau and the Marotos jewelry was it was valued at less, but it was the true value that Marotis had paid for it. It wasn't the the MSRP, uh, which Tibbles was I think was the MSRP. <laughs> oh really? Marotis <laughs> was the money because Marotis was out that money. Yeah. That was their that was so, their hit. You, you've got the bail bondsman. They leave him out there continuing to operate and, and they're continuing to find other people they can buy some of this jewelry from. Is that, was that the I, kind of the. Well, you know how slow the, the feds move. So they're, you know, it's a, it's a slow methodical investigation. Yeah. And then, and I don't remember the exact amount of time that he was out, but then when we, when they do get him in, it seems his story makes sense to me that he didn't get all the, all the jewelry. Um, he didn't set up the robbery. Um, his part in it was he got some, he got a few pieces and he was trying to make some money on the side. Okay. But, I got you. Um, so then so you, does he set up other people? Then they go on to other people to buy some more of this jewelry back. No. Um, he, I think he tells them that it's Clarence Burnett. He confirms that okay. it's Clarence that's doing it, but that sort of, that's sort of a dead end. So that's uh, that's Junior Bradley's illegitimate son. So I don't know anything about, about the guy, but it's uh, the bail bondsman. The bail bondsman is yeah. Junior Bradley's yes. son. Yes. Okay. And and guys, for you, for those those of you who don't know, I've talked about him before. Junior Bradley was a mob connected fence in Kansas City. He was the he he had a whole store filled with boosted goods down at the city market. Uh, some people claim he's a made guy. He was half Italian, but he was he was the guy for the mob in Kansas City. There's no doubt about it. He was Willie Camposano guy, and, and he kicked up to him all the time. And and he was he was a fixer. He he ran information in and out of the penitentiary system. I know a guy that that was given the job of taking care of another internationally known mob guy in another penitentiary. And I said, well. Who told you to do that? Says Junior Bradley got hold of me while I was in the joint and said, expect this guy. So Junior Bradley was the mob fix it guy uh, for the Kansas City mob and the main mob fence. So he got into it. So how, how do you, is that how we get to Angelo Perello? Is that how do we get nope. to Angelo Perello then? Completely disconnected at the uh, time. Well, um, let's continue on then. So, and it, you know, this took a long time. I'm telling this story like it's really happening fast it's really not happening fast mm -hmm. um so we started looking at clarence ricky and i started looking at clarence for this um and the fbi starts to look at clarence and then i think the probably the next step was we got to that perellos had fenced some of this stuff and perellos owned a pawn shop at brush creek or paseo um and then while we're working all this Clarence gets arrested in Oklahoma, Texas, somewhere with in a Winnebago with like 30 kilos or 30 pounds, whatever. I'm not, a, I didn't work drugs um, of cocaine. They have a speedy trial at the defense's request and they get a speedy conviction. So now before we've ever even indicted him for the robberies, um, he's got a conviction, a sizable conviction for cocaine. And by the way, at, the, at this time, it's that case is moved from the case, the agent who originally had it to uh, some other detectives and or some other FBI agents in squad five that are. The Tibble case is, is yes. moved to this other squad. Well, and, so squad five always had it, but some other detective or agents start getting added okay. because it's getting it needs more agents. It's, yeah. it's and big. we all know there's a difference in agents, just like there's a difference in cops and there's a difference in detectives. There's, it can be a yes. huge difference in agents. So you got a good aggressive guy on it. Sounds to me like Clarence is now, <clears throat> he's got this big sentence pending down in Texas. And I, you probably don't know any more about that, but obviously somebody set him up. You just usually don't just snatch somebody off the highway with a, in a Winnebago and, and right. get that kind of seizure. Somebody set him up down there. And, and so now he's 
somebody's going to go down and, and, and start working him. I have to assume, you know, you, we know, you know about this. Maybe we can help on your cocaine thing. Is that how that went down next? Yeah. So we weren't really involved at all at that point, but yeah, somebody from the FBI then starts, you know, working that angle of, you know, we know you did this robbery. You know, you can help us out. Um, we can help you out with your current legal woes. Um, so then he starts cooperating fully. And let me, and that's when we start getting the names of the rest of the crew, right, Jim? Is it because before we didn't know who was, we had some ideas, but we didn't know who was in the crew, correct? We didn't know the whole crew, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we knew who his, his best friends were, you know, the ones yes. he always was getting stopped with, but we didn't have anybody that said, because they didn't they were, all, the yeah. crew didn't stay the same. The crew. Yes. Changed from Perfect. robbery to robbery based upon, I'm guessing, who was getting along, who was in jail, um, that type of thing. And then so then we started getting the. The different men, people in the crew, and it, so the Marodi's robbery is sort of a. A key event because th that crew changes from a from a bunch of pretty hardened career criminals to the guys that Clarence hung out with. So his friends, his, you know, people his age that he knew. And then that's when I think, I'm guessing, that's when they had to start practicing because the crew that hit Marodi's uh, was a seasoned crew. Uh, in fact, they went to, they did a robbery up on um, Vivian and North Oak at a bank um, that a Kansas City police officer off duty interrupted and killed one of them. They got convicted for the so his death. They got convicted for the his death that happened in the commission of crime. So they were in. I don't know if they were all of that crew that robbed that bank, um, but they were at least two of them because the only conviction that the only got the person we didn't convict in the Tivils conspiracy was one of those guys. It didn't matter. He's doing life in prison for that robbery where his cohort got shot. So, so I wish I had a better idea of how quickly, I mean, how it all meshed together, but it was, yeah. it was really slow and stuff just rolled in. So and it just Cla kept Clar building. Clarence is talking to y'all now and, and naming his crews. And you've got these disparate names. You've got these hardened criminals who are part of it. And then you've got these guys who are his friends who are less hardened criminals that have been practicing. And, and you've got him, he's telling about it. And I assume you get those guys in. Now, is that when they start talking about uh, the Perellos? Because I'm really curious how they made that connection with the Perellos. Perellos pawn shop was in the uh, African-American area of the city, shall we say, at yep. Brush Creek and Paseo, and Clarence Burnett was African-American. So had he been doing some business with Perellos and got to know them? I mean, Angelo Perello is not going to just do business with the next guy that comes along. How, you know how that went down? No, so that's again, and Ricky stepped out. Uh, so that's part of the FBI stuff that we weren't part of. Um, and maybe Ricky has more information on that when he comes back in. But and so I talked to Clarence, but I didn't debrief him as much as somebody from the FBI did. So, you know, we had information. Um, and then Becker always had the case. So Becker had the had the the robbery and the the stuff from get go. It just played into his hand that Angelo right. was part of it. And, and so guys, that that he's talking about Paul Becker. Paul Becker is probably the single most aggressive U.S. attorney that we've ever had in this city when it comes to prosecuting the mob. And he is like a dog with a bone when he gets on something. If you get in trouble, you do not want Paul Becker prosecuting you just trust me on that one <laughs> he's a good guy if you're on his side but if you're on the other side he he is a, a, a dog with a bone man and so we're talking about Paul Becker and and then turning Clarence Burnett and pulling in the Perello uh, father and son crew how did you know remember how that happened I don't remember how we got to Perello's I thought that we had done, someone had gone to that pawn shop or said that's where they unloaded from Clarence Burnett's crew, is that that's where they started unloading 
some of the merchandise. I think that's how we got to Prowlos, but I can't remember specifically who said it or when we got there. We didn't have, so we had the innuendo that yeah. Clarence dealt with. Jay's. Jay's J- pawn. Jay's pawn. Yeah, Jay's pawn. So we, but it was nothing that was sticking. It was, you know, yeah. you couldn't right. take it to court. You couldn't, you couldn't get a, sir, you couldn't get anything based upon the information we had. It, well, it just wasn't strong enough. Um, so the FBI was getting the, the information about Angelo Perello at the, at the time that Joe was running Jay's pawn. He also had a jewelry store at 75th in Baltimore, Perello and Sandridge jewelry store. So if you're looking for a way that, you know, because that's a lot of merchandise, as I said earlier, how do you get rid of that? Well, having a legitimate, quote, jewelry store would be a good way to get rid of some of that merchandise. Um, and it, well, and Joe had not only, to have one. Not only that, Jim, but the pawn shop was taken in street level stuff. And this is all high end. I mean, quality stuff. So to get the most money out of it by transferring it to your high-end quality jewelry store, gave them the best, you know, the best bang for their buck, so to speak, of of, of getting the proceeds from the the items from the stones. Right. Yeah, and I think Joe at the Joe had studied diamonds. He was, you know, he he was he could do legitimate business as a diamond seller. He was knowledgeable enough to know what was good and what yeah. wasn't. And that's the son, Joe Perello, who was not really a criminal, particularly like his dad was. His dad was a long time mafia associate career criminal. The son was not really a criminal. I think it was even his adopted son. I'm not sure. Perello and Sandridge or whatever they, it was, they had the name Sandridge connected to that store on Baltimore, 75th and Baltimore. And guys, 75th and Baltimore is more in the Waldo, what we call the Waldo area in the Brickside area. And there's a, and it's real close to a lot of high end neighborhoods and, and Sandridge's, Eddie Sandridge was a long time jewelry thief and fence and his brothers and they they've been mob connected for a long time so the sandwiches even had a place on the plaza at one time they are they had a lot of connections and they had a lot of people that knew that name to have higher end stuff so it makes sense that you would then fence it out through the the one at 75th and baltimore it's so, also a half a block from the original so the first i said you know they did a a yeah. store robbery. It's yeah. a half a block from that store. <laughs> Interesting. So there, the bureaus bought some of this stuff. You mentioned some other sting operations. Were they just like unrelated to this, or was he fencing it to more than one person? And and then they were, they they made some connections to get it back. What about these other stings? So the only other sting I'm aware of is the agent, the FBI agent who was a jewelry dealer, Tony Gillahan, the pawn the pawn shop guy, went to traveled out of town um, and met with them, which was all, all, you know, videotaped and stuff. So that's the only other sting that happened, but that's, that's already happened. So that's before Clarence gets arrested and is telling his story. Yeah. But that was some of the Tibble jewelries, uh, the Tibble pieces. Yes. So yes. How, how did that, I don't, I can't understand how that connected exactly. So they actually have, I've seen the video and I just don't remember it all, but Gillahan. So the the guy that's he's talking on the video about well you know this came from the Tibble jewelry store and you can see Gillahan's like shut up but he's not so yeah. Gillahan says yes so he reluctantly agrees to some of this stuff but they have it on they have it on video that this came from a Tibble jewelry store in Kansas City whole separate operation sounds like yeah then. okay all right moving right along so Clarence Burnett buries Angelo Perello and his son it seems to me like it, it he. He testified and, and he worked a pretty sweet deal. I, I, he did some time, but he probably was looking at 30 years for that that much of a uh, cocaine. Yeah, that's what the cocaine was 30 years. Yeah. But he never got charged with any of the robberies. So when he got the, you know, the customary cooperation, it was off that 30 years. And then he got more and more and more. And I don't know any of the details, but I know enough. To, so he testified for the feds in a stolen auto ring that involved some chiefs at the time. He participated in that or he cooperated in that. So when they brought him in, he not only gave up Perello's <laughs> and the Tibble jewelry store and the guys that did it, he also gave up a stolen auto ring that he was involved in. I remember that uh, uh, Derek Vanover, I think was the chief's yeah. name. Merrick. 
Tamara, Tamara, Tamara and, Vanover. Vanover. and and he was involved in that and they were stealing these high-end cars and I, I don't remember if they're retagging them or what they were doing with them but he gave all that up too he was a pretty valuable informant he had of course he had a lot yeah, he of 30 had, years had, to work off and he worked so he got half and then I think he got half again and his sentencing I don't think Mrs. Marodo Marodi was very happy in fact she was pretty voiced her uh because yeah. when Marodi's got robbed they got guns stuck in their face. Mm -hmm. They were they were in the business when it happened, and their guard was disarmed. Um, it was a you know it's something that family's never going to forget that day because they were they thought they were going to die. I suspect. So how were you in the courtroom? How did he testify? He, he, I've seen him on on uh, the internet. He's got this little uh, hour and some long documentary that that he has made. It looks to me like I think he's back in penitentiary now for a, a probation violation. It, it, I, I couldn't seem to find him anywhere. But so what was that like? How how did he testify? He's he's pretty glib and 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 pretty articulate. Well, he's. He's very smooth and he's very believing, you know, believable. Yeah. Um, he's very good at testifying, in my opinion. So he just looked right at Angelo Perello and said, he's the man, and looked at his son, said, he's the man. Yeah. And, you know, there was a lot of other stuff. And do you know who the attorneys were for the Perellos? Well, I understand uh, David Helfrey, who was the straw man attorney for the skim cases for the prosecution, who is now doing white collar crime yeah. operation. I understand he was one of them, was Joe's. He was the attorney. one from St. Louis that came in, but he's pretty high dollar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Perello had a lot of money. I mean, he they, they had a lot of money. I don't know if they made him forfeit anything or, or how that went down. I know Angelo died in prison at about 99 years old down in Springfield. So and did Joe. Son, and Joe, did he die in prison? I knew he, and he I think died he at got kind cancer. of an early age. Yeah. Didn't he have cancer right when he was getting sentenced, Jim? <laughs> he might. Uh, Angelo tells the story that he was, he was trying to set up Joe in a business so that Joe could have, you know, a business that was his after Angelo was gone i don't think he's that good of a, if he was that good of a father he would have let his kid cooperate because how much you know angela was going to die in prison one way or the other i think he i don't think he was that he wanted to make himself look like a good father and i didn't really buy it because joe should have been allowed to cooperate and get out of jail in a reasonable time right it, it uh, i've heard this from somebody else that when they got ready to go of course the bureau comes to him and you know would but do a deal here. They always offer some kind of a deal. And Angelo, they were not going to really give him much of a deal, but they would have given his son a deal, a really yeah. sweet deal, if he'd testify against his father and about this whole operation. And, and his father, I understand, told him, you cannot testify. Or you cannot take a plea. We've got to to have a trial on this, which is goes right back to Nick Savella. Nick Savella never allowed anybody to plead out when he was alive. So that's uh, it, that was the mafia discipline coming down to that level is what that was, if you ask me. Yeah, because me and the FBI agent who took over the case, um, we went to the pawn shop and we talked to Joe prior to him getting arrested. And I think he was really close to he was he was, he was afraid. He was not a criminal. He was not a hardened criminal. He was I think toughest thing was him was he wasn't going to turn on his dad. But I think he would have. I think he would have. And I I still to this day think he should have cooperated and um got a better deal interesting so if you, i think go ahead sorry gary one of the things and you know we talk about it <clears throat> that was fascinating about this case is how you know fish and i both work center zone we chased clarence burnett when he was 15 <laughs> years old stealing cars he lived at 33rd and tracy and i mean he was a just a young kid in the neighborhood who you know, was looking for an opportunity when, you know, back then you'd pop the steering column on the old Chevy and you'd see, yeah. feel it and drive around. We would chase him around the blocks there between Linwood and Armour and his in his car between Paseo and, and Truce running in there because he would always run home on 33rd and Tracy because he, he didn't know anywhere else to go. Yeah. And so, I mean, it is fascinating to see and then how that street level crime evolves and turns all the way into a mob connection yeah. i mean i just through my years i've never seen that that portray out you know to to evolve or evolve to that kind of criminal activity yeah and it was really fascinating to see that 
I, I never have either. And and this guy, this Clarence Burnett, he's one of these guys that if he just hadn't gone down that criminal path, if he hadn't had that oh, yeah. twist in his brain, he would have been successful. Because I think if you followed him after he got out of prison, he got into buying and selling houses and real estate. And, and yeah. of course, then he cheats somebody out of $20,000 in a real estate deal. And, and they file charges against him and they violate his probation or his parole. And, and, and so it just keeps bouncing in and out. But he's he's real uh, uh, bright. And and he can and he's can put things together and he's smooth. Uh, you know, I don't know. He put this documentary together, guys. I'll put a link to that documentary where he tells his side of the story and, and about that and a whole lot of other crimes. And he talks to some people that are in witness protection on the phone. And uh, it, this guy is something else. I got to try to get a hold of him and get him on the show. But I, I tried and I can't seem to find him right now. So well, he'd be way better than Fish and Rick on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a TV show. Um, it's a it was a Canadian production that came in town. They wanted to do a story about the Tivoli robbery. Yeah, and it was called Masterminds. In fact, he yeah. has a link to it on his yeah. website. So he's a criminal and a he's not my favorite person. Uh, <laughs> he's victimized a lot of people. Yeah, yes, um, yes. But I could see which way this show was going, and it wasn't to my liking, but. I, I participated, but so they asked me, they said, well, you know, what do you think will happen with Clarence when he get out, gets out And it? My, I don't appear on the, my clip doesn't make the cut. I said, <laughs> well, he's a criminal. He's been a criminal his whole life. Yeah. He may not, when he gets out, he will commit crime again. Yeah. And he will go to jail again. Um, but he's probably going to do something more of a white collar crime because he's, <laughs> he's a smart enough guy not to, you know, you get a lot more time if you, pull a gun on somebody than if you, you convince them to give them your money. Yeah. Um, so I didn't make the edit, but his attorney said, well, I'd like to think, you know, in a, you know, with different circumstances, he'd be managing a store on the plaza and that made the clip. I didn't make yeah, it, well, but I, I, he's a criminal. He can't, yeah, he, he can't is. do anything but criminal activity. But th there's a couple of things, Gary, when we, we had, Clarence's car, his car towed at some time during the operation. We were watching some things and we had his, wasn't it his truck we towed, Jim? This at the black tow yep. Yeah. And we had the helicopter up. He he went and got his car. He pulled it 100 feet down the drive and the helicopter goes, he's out of the car. He's going around the car. He's checking the whole car. He's on his back underneath the car. I mean, he... <laughs> He's he looking was, for a tracking device. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he was on it. You know, he was constantly thinking about how the police and several times we tried to follow some of him and his associates. And I mean, it was a nightmare. I mean, they, they were taking evasive action. They drive a hundred. They would, you know, go down streets and blow stop signs and all kinds of stuff. I mean, that they were that part of the streetwise crew they were very streetwise, in my opinion, some of the players. Now, some of, like Jim said, some of the friends, maybe not so much, but the people who were in it constantly, they were very streetwise to the police. Yeah, yeah they were calling out the surveillance. Yeah, yeah. All right, I think we've covered it. I think we've covered the the, the whole nine hey. yards here. Unless you got something else you want to say. Why? Hey, Jim, what you... was the complaint number? 9711-7510. <laughs> That's going to make it. <laughs> You're obsessed, Jim. You're obsessed with this guy. <laughs> I wrote that complaint number on a lot of pieces of paper. Hey, hey Gary, I, I know Jim's got to go, but can I tell you the story about how, yeah. how Jim yeah. kept a surveillance car for a year out of yeah. the garage? I've told this story a thousand times. I know how it goes. I'll see you. Thank <laughs> you. Right. See you, Jim. Thank you. So go ahead, so, we were in robbery and we had to get a, a surveillance car and our captain was real skittish about letting us have our own surveillance car. Oh right? my God. Yes. I remember. Yeah, oh yeah. Days. Back in the day. I mean, that was just horrible. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, Jim and I go down and we get a surveillance car. Now we went through three of them in a year and a half, but we get our first one and, and we're driving it. And, and we, we you know, you were supposed to, sign it out for 30 days or whatever. Well, we kept it. We were driving it to and from home. Well, the car breaks down one night. I said, Jim, he goes, I'm bringing it to the garage tomorrow morning. I go, no, you're not. And he goes, yeah, I got to get it fixed. I go, 
you're going to bring it to the garage Sunday night. And he goes, what? And I go, yeah, Jim, when the car broke down for me, I went on Sunday night too, because guess what? They give you another car and they don't check any records. <laughs> 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 on Sunday night, there's just a lone guy at the garage, yeah. man in the desk. He's just like, hey, go get that car. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so we had this, we had this thing. No matter what happened to the surveillance car, I didn't go back till Sunday night. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then the captain found out we had kept the surveillance car on a 30-day thing for a year and a half. And oh. we've been driving it the whole time. <laughs> We got called in the office. Holy smokes, did we get it on that one? <laughs> but it was worth it because we had the car anytime we needed it. And yeah. we were running around all the time. But you know how the PD is, Gary. You know, they were so tight about those oh, things. Yes, and they didn't want anyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was yeah. good. And yeah, I, that was, I that was you, you know, pretty slick. <laughs> it was good. We, we, we put our heads together to keep that. So. And, you know, about after the I got I promoted out of robbery, I think I was 32nd on the sergeant's list. Um, so I I leave before all this is unfolding. And that was really hard because I couldn't I couldn't yeah. stay with the case. Yeah, and, tough. yeah, I had to go out south and and Jim really did a fantastic job of coordinating and keeping that going with the FBI and making the rest of the indictments and the rest of the players. Yeah. That, he did an outstanding job. Yeah. That, that one agent, Doug Fensel was involved on the periphery of it. And he told me, yeah, I said that, that Harrington, that detective, I think he couldn't even remember his name. He said, that detective boy, he, he stuck right in there. He said he was good. <laughs> and I yeah. he was talking about Harrington as he described him. <laughs> well, and Jim goes on, you know, to work Stevie Wright, who was another, you know, street level guy in Kansas City who had committed numerous murders and gotten away with all of them. No one, yeah. no one would testify. No one would say anything. And Jim again partnered up with the FBI and um, had another partner, and he was on special assignment because of his success. I believe on the Tivol case, they gave him the latitude dude again yeah. in the police department which was unheard of to yeah. pull him aside and give him carte blanche to work on stevie for a better part of a year i think yeah. year and a half maybe and to get him uh, federally indicted and put away and and jim did that too so i mean you i mean jim harrington has got to be yeah, one of the better good, detectives yeah. that have ever come through kcpd yeah, I believe it. I, he, I think I did that story with him. I did a story with him a long time ago when I first started doing this. There was an article in the pitch or something about this blood or this crip and and this yeah. and this guy that had gotten away with all these murders. It, yeah, I, I did that. Yeah, a lot of people really liked that that show. I have to hash that back. Go dig that out. And maybe recut it and put some of the good parts back out whenever I release this one. Well, and, and then Jim goes on to, you know, when career criminals form, then Jim is one of the original detectives that mm -hmm. goes into career criminal. Again, based on, I think, all of his previous, you know, um, expert, you yeah. know, detective work in these federal cases that he's done a great job on. Yeah. So then Jim is recruited. Actually, Jim at the time, we were working together. I was a sergeant in homicide. He was a detective in homicide. And that's where he gets recruited out of there to be one of the founding members of the career criminal unit oh, yeah. under Sergeant Eric Greenwell. Oh, yeah. I remember that squad. That was a pretty good squad. That Yeah. That yeah. Going. It's kind of towards so, the end of mine. Well, I just wanted to add that one piece of humor because yeah. I, I think if if any KCPD members you know were to watch this, that they get a chuckle out of that one. Yeah, we, you know, that, we we pulled one over on the department on that one. <laughs> oh, they will, they will, they'll see it. Well, there's, there's, there's quite a few. I had one guy a couple of years ago message me or something. He said, "Yeah," he said. Uh, Man, he said, I, I volunteered to ride the wagon last night so I could just listen to your podcast all night long. <laughs> and I was out at the Royal Stadium once and I I, I must have posted something on Facebook and, and some guy I didn't know that had been a podcast fan 
saw that I it was on my Facebook too. And, and he was, of course, bored. He's looking at his Facebook. And, and so he messaged me, said, Oh, he said, are you here at the ball game? I'm over at gate. So-and-so so I go over and talk to him. There's, there's a lot of guys that, that listen to the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of fun. This is a great, great opportunity to, you know, talk about some of the successes, you know, um, I can remember Gary, when we were doing the F this thing with the jewelry, we are at the, Jim and I were at the local office and one of the supervisors brought out trays of diamonds that the FBI had really? used for stings and yeah. things like that. I mean, it was amazing. Different shapes, sizes. They're all, they're all these stones in there. And I mean, I, you know, I, it was my first like exposure to the depth of the FBI and what yeah. the FBI can really do when they put their mind to it. I mean, the resources and, and like this gemologist that they had that was the undercover. I mean, you know, I don't think like Jim said, if you went to a jewelry store anywhere in America and he was working the counter, you'd have no idea that that guy had law enforcement background. I yeah. mean, he was that good. Right. Yeah, so they've got the resources. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> right. So there were some things like that that were really fun to get yeah. into. Yeah, really. Jeez. You know, Jim was the, the primary he was the one who came up with Clarence Burnett you know I was I was the only one my my original thing to this was Jim we need to get the case yeah. um because we can't it, it, the other detectives just weren't doing shit and it yeah. really bothered us oh yeah I know I've been there I've seen yes it. yes <laughs> and you like hey these people are I mean they hit the store on the plaza I mean this yeah. was this was like you know Back in the day when the plaza was something, you don't yeah. walk on the plaza and rob a store, not <laughs> in Kansas big. City, Missouri, yeah, right? Big, yeah. You, yeah, we got to get on this. And, you know, Jim and I felt like we should really jump into this. And every time we tried, it, it just, it was, it was another thing about, you know, how the department is, someone gets assigned a case and it's their case, it ain't your case. And so it was yeah. a big deal to transfer that case. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the yeah. guy that had it, it didn't have no, it probably had no imagination, and it was going to be a lot of work. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so you know, it just didn't go anywhere. Yeah. Um, but it anyway. That's about it. I can't. I can't remember. I mean, okay. I can tell you that it was some of the best police work. And once we got in coordination with the FBI, I, I mean, here's two detectives from Kansas City, Missouri, working on things that are occurring in Dallas and this plaza and all kinds of stuff. I mean, once we got into it and those FBI people really started to trust us, I mean, we were in, we, yeah. we, we were as good as gold with them. Yeah. Cool. Well, guys, that was a heck of a story. Wasn't it? The, the kind of inside baseball, if you will, about running a robbery investigation on a big time robbery and having to work with the FBI. There's always these different, you know, you, you read a lot about and you see it in the popular media, these brushes between jurisdictions and law enforcement agencies and all that. And, and that's kind of really how it works. As long as you're working hard and, and they're working hard and, and nobody tries to hide anything and you work together and you let some people hide some stuff if they feel like they need to, don't try to step out of your lane. It'll all come together. And, and this came all, all came together with uh, Jim Harrington ended up, Rick got promoted and left, but Rick, uh, Jim Harrington ended up really being uh, integral with the prosecution of this all the way through, just like the, the other FBI agents that ended up getting assigned to it. I, um, uh, I, I really, uh, I really admire both these guys. They were, they were great policemen. And like I said, Rick went on to be the chief of police during the, the, the worst time ever to be a chief of police uh, around the George Floyd times and, and all those demonstrations what us and every city in the United States had. And he had the newspapers after him and it was, uh, you know, but he survived all that and, and he did it with, with grace and abilities and, and got on through and has since retired now, uh, I remember Rick when he was a young patrol officer and a young tech guy. Uh, so, but he's a good guy. He's been my friend all for 20 some years, 25 years, I guess. And see, uh, don't forget, I like to ride motorcycles. And when you're in your car out there, watch out for motorcycles. If you have a problem with PTSD and you've been in the service, I just saw a deal on the paper in the uh, news this morning about PTSD and service members and different kinds of alternative therapies. 
at least get started with the VA and go to their website and get that hotline number. And there's other therapies out there. These guys were going down in Mexico and doing some mushrooms and, and it seemed to be helping. So, I, you know, I, what do I know? If you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, which often goes, goes hand in hand with uh, PTSD, whether you're in the service or not, you can get help with that. Go to our friend, former Gambino soldier, although I've had people tell me that he wasn't a soldier. I think he was. I think he was a made guy, but I, you know, he was a legacy for sure. His dad was a made guy in the Gambino family. Anthony Ruggiano, and he's a drug and alcohol counselor down in Florida. And on his website and his YouTube page, he's got a hotline number. So you can go into therapy or go into treatment rather with a, a, a real deal mob guy being your drug and alcohol counselor. Wouldn't that be cool? Let me know if you ever do that. So don't forget to like and subscribe if you're on YouTube. Give me a review. Uh, support the podcast in any way you can. Share share it with your friends. We need to grow and grow and grow. We've got to come back at these mob guys that have their podcast. But we get we've got our own side and our own slant on things. And so thanks a lot, guys.